welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to build a Ryzen PC, with a particular focus on selecting the best value components. Specifically, we're going to be fitting this processor, motherboard, an SSD and RAM in my AMD test rig, so you could call this an upgrade. However, it's probably best described as a build because the only things we're keeping from the old system are the power supply and the case. So, let's go and get started. Right, here we have our components. And in late June 2023, these, or equivalent, cost about $270 or £234 on Amazon US and UK. For this we get a 6-core Ryzen 5 system with integrated graphics, along with 16GB of RAM and a 500GB M.2 SSD. So, let's run through the individual parts. Our processor here is this Ryzen 5 5600G that I purchased for £109 in the UK and which costs $121.56 on Amazon.com. The 5600G is a 6-core processor with a base clock of 3.9GHz boosting to 4.4, and it's a 5000 series Ryzen chip with a Zen 3 architecture. This means that it's a generation behind the latest desktop Ryzen processors, and going back one generation means we get a very good deal. Indeed, if I'd gone for one of the latest 7000 series Ryzen 5s, the best price for 7600X would have been £218.96 or $239. Our 5600G, which we can see looking out through this panel on the side of the box, is an APU, and this means it contains a CPU and a GPU. Specifically, the 5600G has 7-core Radeon graphics clocked at 1900 MHz, so we won't need to install a graphics card. All Ryzen APUs have a G suffix, with the latest being the Ryzen 5 5600G and Ryzen 7 5700G, both of which can handle some 1080p gaming and video editing. Currently, there are no G suffix Ryzen 7000 desktop APUs, but all Ryzen 7000 series processors have an RDNA 2 integrated GPU, so it can be used in a system without a graphics card. However, to build an earlier series Ryzen PC without a graphics card, a G suffix APU must be used, such as a 5600G, 5700G, 4600G, or 3400G. Purchasing a 5000 series or earlier Ryzen requires the use of a motherboard with an AM4 rather than an AM5 socket, and this is less expensive. Specifically, this Gigabyte A520M S2H socket AM4 motherboard cost me £58 or would have been $81 on Amazon.com. This said, a better priced US alternative would be the MSI A520MA Pro Gaming for $69.99, which is based on the same A520 chipset. These prices compare to £84.72 for the cheapest AM5 motherboard on Amazon UK, or $110.22 in the United States. If we add in the price of 16GB of appropriate RAM, and a 500GB Samsung Evo SSD, we get our total build cost of £234.34 or $270.53 plus case and power supply. This compares to £381.51 or $454.39 for a Ryzen 5 7600X system, which I think makes our 5600G build the best value although this is very much an individual judgement and prices are constantly changing. For reference, I'll include the specification and links for both alternatives in the video description, and all of the products I've mentioned are also listed in the Ryzen PC build section of the Explaining Computers Amazon storefront, and as an Amazon associate I do earn a commission from any qualifying purchase. Back 
with our motherboard, this is based on a 500 series AMD chipset, which is the most recent for a socket AM4 processor. The box indicates that 5000 series processors, like our 5600G, are supported, but before purchasing a motherboard, always check the online CPU support list. Sometimes, even if a processor is supported, a BIOS upgrade may be needed. And this board has a feature called QFlash Plus, which allows the BIOS to be upgraded without a compatible processor being fitted. And I'll say a bit more about this in a second. When choosing a motherboard, we also need to consider what type of chipset meets our requirements. AMD chipsets start with a letter A, B or X, with A having the lowest specification and X the highest. So, this A520 motherboard has the minimum specification of any 500 series, although it's perfectly suitable for most users, most definitely including myself. Do note, however, that you can't overclock an A chipset, so if you want to experiment with overclocking, you'll have to pay more for a B or X chipset motherboard. And you can learn more about chipsets in my Explaining Motherboard Chipsets video. Anyway, let's now get inside. Let's open it up nice and straightforward. Oh look, it's a new motherboard. And down here we've got the uh, back panel, the I.O. plate, some SATA leads it looks, seems, and uh, I think I'm just thumping my mic there. Sorry about that. And let's get inside. There we are. Here is our motherboard and uh, it's taped up at the back. I'm going to bring in Mr. Scissors so I don't destroy the bag. Always useful to have good motherboard bags about. There we are. And if we just go inside like this, yes, there we have our brand new motherboard. Always great to have a new computer motherboard. In the middle, we have our AM4 processor socket. Our Ryzen chip will go in here. And then up from that, we have two slots for taking DDR4 memory modules. These will accommodate up to 64 gigabytes of RAM. Across the board, under this heatsink, is our A520 chipset. It's hiding under here. And then next to that, we've got three PCIe slots. And uh, one of these is time 16, so it could take a graphics card. We won't be fitting a graphics card in this slot in this particular build, but we could do that in the future. And we've also got two times one slot, which could take other expansion cards. And it's worth noting that all of these slots are PCIe 3.0, which is slower than the PCIe 4.0 standard found on motherboards used with the latest Ryzen 7000 series processors. Also here, before we move on, we've got an M.2 slot. This can take a SATA or an NVMe SSD. And if you don't want to plug in storage via the M.2 slot, down here we've got four standard SATA ports. If we take a look at the back panel, we find a PS2 mouse or keyboard socket, along with two Type-A USB 2 ports. Although there's also a header on the motherboard for adding two more USB 2 ports. We then have a VGA socket and DVI-D socket, as well as an HDMI socket, and all of these can be used at the same time. This board does support three simultaneous displays. When it comes to resolution, the HDMI port is the highest. This supports true 4K, 4096 by 2160 at up to 60 frames a second, whereas the VGA and DVI-D ports support 1920 by 1200 at 60 frames a second. And do remember, you'll only get a signal from these ports if you fit this motherboard with an APU with a Ryzen processor with a G suffix. Moving along, we find gigabit ethernet and four USB 3 ports, specifically USB 3.2 Gen 1. Those are 10 gigabit per second ports. And if you're confused by USB, you're not the only person. You can learn more in my explaining USB video. And if we want more USB 3 ports, there's also a header on the motherboard for adding two more of those. Finally here, we've got three 3.5 millimeter audio jacks. And down here, a very interesting thing, this is our QFlash Plus button. And this works in tandem with the LED next to it and also the USB port next to that. If you're wondering why this USB 3 port is white, it's because it's the QFlash USB port. And so what happens is if you need to update the BIOS on this motherboard, you don't have to get a compatible processor and fit it, update your BIOS, get rid of that processor, put your new processor in. No, all you have to do is to download a new BIOS file from the Gigabyte website, 
put it on a USB drive, put it into the, uh, the white USB port, and then power up the board and press the QFlash button. And the motherboard will then update its BIOS without having to have a processor installed. And so there we are. This is our motherboard, and I think it's now time to fit it with our Ryzen 5 5600G. Right, shall we open up our processor? Let's bring in Stanley the knife and uh, cut through the top like that. And in here we should find two things, which are our race cooler. Let's get that out like that. Come on, there we are, that's the cooler. We'll be fitting this in a second. And also in here, of course, well, there's also a leaflet, but I've forgotten that. But other than that, we've got this. This is our processor, this is our Ryzen 5600G. And let's use the magic of filmmaking to carefully remove it from the packet. There we go. I find these things amazing. This is an incredible piece of, of modern engineering. Let's just uh, very carefully flick it over without touching the pins. And uh, there we are, we can see the pins on the back. And it's worth noting this is the last generation of Ryzen to have pins rather than pads on the processor. The 7000 series Ryzen's have got, well, pads rather than pins. Anyway, if we now go across to the processor socket on the motherboard, we can open it up by raising this lever like this. And in one corner of a the socket, there is a small triangle. And what we need to do is to take our processor and gently drop it into place, matching up the triangle on the processor with the uh, triangle on the socket, like that. And with that positioned like that, we can now put down the lever. And there we are, our processor is locked in place. Next, we're going to turn our attention to the cooler. This is AMD's standard stock rate cooler. Let's just open it up. There we are, like that. And to get the thing out of the box, like uh, that. And as we can see on the base of the cooler, there's some pre-applied thermal compounds, some thermal paste. We want to be very careful not to touch that. That's going to contact the processor. So we're going to be careful with this. This is where we put it down. But here is the, the rate cooler. And uh, to fix this to the motherboard, we need to go back to the motherboard to remove these brackets. And just to show you, these screw into a base plate, which is uh, underneath. You can see the base plate here, but we don't need the bracket screwed into it to fit a standard Wraith cooler. So I'm going to bring in Mr. Screwdriver and get rid of these. There we go. And we can now bring in our cooler, which still has its thermal compound nice and intact underneath. And the standard position of the cooler, I'm going to keep this above the process for a second, the standard position would be like this. But this is going to be very tight on the RAM. It often is tight on the RAM. And it is possible if you want to go under the cooler, release a little screw under here, and to rotate the cooler so the AMD logo is up here. But I'm going to take the pragmatic solution, which will probably shock some people, and fit the cooler like this. And that way, the AMD logo is at the top, and it isn't going to interfere with our RAM. So. I'm now going to carefully lower this down on top of the processor like that, getting everything lined up. That's cool. And we now need to tighten up the screws. And we'll start with that one. The trick with this is to do a little bit of a turn on one, just a little bit, then move to an opposite corner and do a bit of that. And I think this is our final corner. I've just gone round, as you can see, diagonals tightening as we go. and. Uh, I think this is just about it. There we are. I'll just check everything is okay. It seems to be okay. And uh, yes, we have now got our cooler connected firmly to our motherboard. So the only thing that needs to be done other than stopping the screwdriver rocking around on the table is to connect in the CPU fan, which this cable here connects down here. So we'll put this in like that. And there we are, our build is progressing Quite nicely, we've now got a motherboard fitted with a processor and cooler. Greetings! Shall we fit some memory and storage? Why not? And I think we'll start with memory, and specifically this 16 gigabyte Corsair kit containing two 8 gigabytes dual inline memory modules. So let's just uh, get inside, bring in uh, Stand with a knife and hopefully get in like that. And uh, I purchased these from Amazon, like everything else in this build. And there we are. There's our memory. 
and I paid £35.99 for this 16 gigabytes of memory. I find that absolutely staggering. And uh, 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM currently costs just over $40 in the United States. So let's go across to the motherboard where we need to open up the clips on the dim slots like that. And if we now take our first memory module, sadly they don't fit this way around with a nice logo at the front. They fit the other way around. They only go in one way around and this way uh, is it. Like that, that's all uh, clipped into place. And if we now fit the other one, because we might as well have all the memory in the computer, like this. Very good. And next, if we turn to storage, here we have our NVMe M.2 SSD. As you can see, it's a Samsung Evo, a Samsung Evo Plus. And this costs me £31.35, or they're about $37.99 in the United States. And again, I find this is an amazing price. Let's just get in with a Stanley the knife. But uh, getting a drive of this spec for that price, except we can't get in. Let us in. It won't let us in, dearie me. Something always has to go wrong with me getting inside. There we are. We've got inside. And anyway, as I was saying, amazing for the price. I remember the first ever M.2 SSD I ever looked at was 500 gigabytes. It cost $200. And now we've got a drive of the same capacity for under $40, just over £30. So let's go and get this fitted, where we need to start up by removing the M.2 retaining screw like this. There we go. And we can now take our drive, which goes in at an angle like that. Just push it in, get it nice and level, push it down, screw comes back in, and there we are. Very easily indeed, we've fitted our M.2 SSD. And so we've now built a complete Ryzen PC with its processor, cooler, memory, and storage. Right, shall we put our new PC in my old case? Why not? And as you can see, this case has got a side panel because it's a 10 plus year old case. And under this side panel, there are two 120 millimeter fans. They're not speed controlled, but they're nice fans. They're quite quiet. And you can turn them on and off using this switch here. You can turn them on in the summer, off in the winter, etc. Anyway, for now, let's get that out of the way down there. And there's also two other 120mm fans in this case, neither speed controlled. There's one under here, one at the front, nice and quiet. We can wire that into power via a lead down here. And there's also one at the back, which is a bit noisy. So I think I'm going to replace this fan. So I'll just get on with that. There we go. And in this case, we've got a power supply. It's a fairly modern power supply, a Corsair TX 550M, 550 watt gold rated power supply. If you want to know more about power supplies, I've got a video on power supplies coming up on my channel very soon. And also in this case at the front, we have got some drives mounted, specifically a DVD and a trailer's three and a half inch removable drive bay, very useful on a test rig. And this can take not just three and a half inch drives, but also two and a half inch SSDs if they're mounted in suitable caddies. Although in this build right now, I'm going to leave these drives disconnected. So before we can put in the new motherboard, we have to take out the old IO panel, which, uh, oh, that was quite easy. Hopefully the new one will go in just as easily. Here is the new one that came in the motherboard box. Fitting these can be very straightforward or an absolute swine. This is, oh, that seemed to be straightforward. So that's, that means luck is on my side. What's about to go wrong next? Anyway, that's in, and I've checked that the risers in the case are in the right places for the motherboard. They've only got one particular place here, but there are various holes in some cases, so you've got to make sure these are in the right place. But uh, with them in the right place, we can take our motherboard and mount it in the case. We can just put it in here, has to line up, has to come through at the back. This is always slightly tricky. But is it in roughly the right position? I think it is. That's looking okay. I think it is. So if we get the first screw in, that'll make it uh, nice and secure. Yes, I'm uh, happy with that. So I'll put in the rest of the screws. And here we are. 
last screw going in, the motherboard is now firmly, securely and happily mounted in the case. Although it's missing all the knitting, all of this stuff. We have to put all of these cables in. And indeed we'll start with this one, which is the 24 pin ATX power connector. We'll plug this in down here like this. And then we'll move on down here to fit this, which is the eight pin 12 volt power connector. Next, we need to wire up the front panel, specifically the power LED, the drive LED, the power switch and the reset switch. And as I'm fitting these, I'll let you know I've got a video all about PC front panel connectors. And next to the front panel connectors, I'm going to fit this, which is a small speaker, a buzzer, which will allow the, the BIOS to send us little beeps occasionally, which can be quite useful. So we'll plug this in like that. And then along from it, we'll plug in the connector for this case's front USB 2 ports. And unfortunately, this case doesn't have any front USB 3 ports at the moment. If it did, they'd plug into this connector down here, but I might add a bay for these in the future, as I've done to many other older PC cases. But for now, we'll move on to plug in the case's front audio connectors. And finally, we'll plug in the cable for our rear system fan. And with everything as neat as it's going to get in a case without a cable management system, I think I'm going to declare this upgrade, this Ryzen build, to be complete. So, does it work? Well, if I turn on the power, like that, you'll see that it does. And in its life, this PC will run all manner of operating systems. But for a first test, I've installed Zorin OS 16. And if you want a guide for installing Zorin OS 16, guess what? You can look in my Zorin OS 16 video. And note that in the PC's BIOS, which is accessed by pressing the delete key on boot, I've enabled an extreme memory profile, an XMP, so that our DDR4 RAM runs at its maximum of 3200 MHz, rather than the default of 2133. Here on the desktop, rather than running benchmarks, it'll basically demonstrate that we've got a pretty fast CPU and a relatively slow GPU, I thought I'd practically demonstrate three pieces of graphically heavy software. And we'll start with Blender, the 3D modeling and uh, other things package, which ironically I've got showing us an animation of a discrete graphics card. There we are, but it works uh, perfectly well. There's no doubt you could model and render and do all kinds of exciting things in render on this PC. Secondly, I've installed, let's not say that, there we are, Caden Live, the video editor. Again, you could do some video editing on this system. Let's bring in a test file and uh, come on, computer, bring it in. There we are. And this is an HD edit, 1920-1080, but the footage on the timeline here that's playing is 4K. It's 150 megabit 4K footage. And as we can see, when we get to the mixes between the two tracks, they work perfectly well. There's no doubt you could do some decent video editing on this system. It's not the most powerful piece of hardware for doing video editing on, but it works. I'm not relying here on proxy clips. Finally, if we just come out of this, I'm not a gamer, but what I have done is to install X-Plane 11. So let's run this up and speed on through until we're actually flying. And here we are. I'm now in control of the plane. I'm flying it with a mouse, which is, oops, whoa, no, 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 that wasn't a good. Other way, other way, other way. And oh, look at the trails. It's, ah, no, 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 no. Come, can you come all the way around? Please come all the way around. I don't think this is going very well. Oh, no. Oh, that's going to get better. No, it's, no, it isn't. Oh, oh. Oh dear, that wasn't ideal, was it? But um, at the very least, I have demonstrated it's possible to run graphically intensive programs using the integrated graphics on a Ryzen 5 5500G. So there we are. My AMD test rig has been upgraded and hopefully I've demonstrated that by using recent but not the latest components, it's possible to build a great system for a reasonable price. Over the next few months, we'll be returning to our new Ryzen build in a number of different hardware and software videos. But now that's it for another video. 
If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.